Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is true and living. And Lord, pray that as we uh, open this passage and look at this passage in Philippians, you'd speak to us, Lord, about uh, your truths uh, and what it means for our lives. Lord, help us to respond. Help us to hear well um, that these aren't just words to a church, uh, aren't just Paul's words to a church 2,000 years ago. They are your words, Lord, to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're continuing our our series through Philippians, Joy Unshaken, as we look at what it means to be a church and to stand on the unshakable joy of Christ. This letter is all about this idea of joy uh, in Christ. You know, we've all been discontent, I'm sure, at one point or another. Uh, I'm sure if I ask you to put your hands up, if you've been discontent, We'd all be able to do it. I won't make you do it uh, and offer what it was about. But we we always can find something to complain about, don't we? You know, the weather's either too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry. Uh, Or, you know, porridge again in the morning. You know, there's a lot to complain about. Uh, It's discontentment. And it's this idea of being dissatisfied or unhappy or worse, even resentful and envious of your lot in life. Um, or the circumstances you find yourself in. You know, I looked up the definition of um, discontentment uh, the other day, and I thought that the example sentence was kind of um, timely. It said, voters voiced discontent with both parties. Didn't say any more about which both parties were. The story is told also uh, about a pilot who always uh, flew over the Appalachian Mountains. He was a commercial airline pilot. And he'd fly over the the mountains, um, and every time he went over a certain valley, he'd look down intently at this one um, bend in the river that he could see down there. And and this would happen each time he flew over it, he'd stare down at this one point as it went past. And finally the co-pilot asked him, um, asked the pilot, what's so interesting about that one spot down there? Why do you keep staring at it? And the pilot replied, he said, well, see that stream down there and the the bend in the river? Uh, When I was a kid, I used to sit there. Uh, and and, and I went, as I went fishing, and I'd look up at the planes going past and I'd say, I wish I could be up there in that plane and be a pilot. And now I'd fly over and look down and say, I wish I could be down there fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always tempting to think that uh, somewhere else is better than where we are now. Uh, always tempting to think that if we only had a little more, everything would be fine. We think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Perhaps there's even more discontentment in our society today because we have so many options, if you like. So much wealth and and riches and opportunities around us that we think we might be able to get or think we uh, need to have. Uh, And covetousness kind of sneaks in, that tenth commandment that we, uh, which is easy to kind of ignore on the list but much harder to avoid. Um, And uh, in, a, in a world which seemingly offers so much. Um, we walk, I walked down the street the other day with Jeremy, uh, past a car that looked like this, and I said to Jeremy, man, I would love to have a drive in that car. I said, I'm not asking for the whole thing, Lord. When I pray for this, I'm just asking for a drive. Uh, it would satisfy my discontentment of our Toyota Prado that I have to drive around at the moment, uh, or the big blue Mondeo beast that I have to drive sometimes. Just one drive, come on. Are we in agreement? You, you, you know I'm going to catch you, don't you? Because then I'm going to say, see, we're all discontent. <laughs> However, the passage flies in the face of this attitude of discontentment and actually tells us the opposite, that we can, in fact, be content in every circumstance. Just imagine for a moment, will you, a point in time when you weren't content, um, when you were frustrated or dissatisfied with something or someone, or you were discontent with progress or changes, or you might have even felt that God just wasn't doing things as fast as he should be. Discontent. And tell me, in that moment, as you think about what it was like, is it as easy as flicking a switch, you know, that, that switch of contentment, and, and suddenly, all's well. I'm content. No, it doesn't work like that, does it? It's not as simple as that. And it's not as simple as doing something to sort of suddenly be content. We can't just like eat chocolate and realign our contentment 
buttons. Although that does work for some people, I understand. Momentarily, though, you'll find it ultimately doesn't work. So how can we stand here this morning and announce to the world that we can be content in every circumstance? Well, this is what we want to look at this morning. This is the claim that we want to kind of prove, I guess, from this passage and how it might work in our lives. The context here that the Philipp- uh, is the context here in this passage that Paul gets to here at the end of chapter four is that the Philippian church has sent a gift to Paul uh, to cover some of the costs, uh, his costs it seems, and it says in verse eighteen. If you've got the, your Bibles, open it up. We'll be going through this, but also um, jumping around a bit this passage. Uh, it says in verse eighteen, uh, "I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent." So this is a context. He, he's taking this opportunity really to thank the Philippians for this gift. But he doesn't really do it directly. He doesn't just say thanks. That would be the simple option, wouldn't it? Uh, Instead, there's sort of almost this awkwardness uh, uh, to how he goes about it. I don't know if you notice that, but you'll see what I'm talking about soon. The closest he comes really to saying thanks for the gift is halfway through in verse 14. He says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And he goes on to remind them in the following verses that uh, they were the only ones that helped him out in the early days of his ministry in Macedonia. Thanks, Philippian church, he's pretty much saying. But even this moment passes quite quickly and is sort of buried in amongst the rest of the passage which actually when you summarise this passage, it seems Paul comes across quite rude. He's pretty much saying, well, it's about time, but I don't need it, but thanks anyway, and I'll try and put it to good use. (coughs) But far from being rude, Paul's actually responding in a Christ-centred gospel way. And each step of the way as he does this, he's keen to point to the Philippians and use this opportunity to help the Philippians see a bigger picture, point the Philippians to Christ, to their Lord and his, and to the one who provides all things, as it says, and and as as he finishes in verse 20, to whom is all glory forever. Amen. And so, although the passage might immediately seem to be talking about money, and people might have thought when they heard the reading, I know he's going to get up and and tell us to give more like the Philippian church, um, it's actually not about that. Paul Paul threads a different pattern through this passage than just the immediate context of a financial gift for himself. He wants uh, us to step back and see a wider understanding of God's provision, his strength in us and through us, and the contentment that comes as a result. Sure, we can apply this to money and finances, but it's not the only thing that we can learn from this passage. And this tone of of pointing to God or pointing to Christ is set right from the start in verse 10 when he says, I rejoiced in the Lord. I rejoiced in the Lord. The joy of Philippians is right through the letter. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. It seems that he's not so much rejoicing in the gift he gets, but in the fact that they're able to give it. In other words, they are, they are at a point as a church to be able to uh, do this sort of thing, in spite of some of the struggles they've had and the persecution they've faced. Uh, and now, as it says in verse 10, you have the opportunity to give this gift to me. But Paul's quick to point out, really quick to point out, um, that he's not speaking of being in need. In fact, I don't need anything. In other words, I don't need this gift, like I said. Uh, And this is where he makes this huge claim that we're talking about this morning. I don't need anything, he says, because I've I've learned in whatever situation to be content. He goes on in verse 12, uh, because I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. In other words, I haven't been hanging out for this gift, discontent with my lot and grumpy about the fact that you Philippians haven't sent me anything, let alone all the other churches. He's not resentful of the the fact that he's been stoned and beaten and run out of towns and thrown in jail and shipwrecked and bitten by a snake and in jail again in Rome. This is Paul's story. He had plenty of reason to be discontent. 
he had plenty of reason to think the grass was perhaps greener somewhere else. He wanted to go to Spain, he says elsewhere. Uh, he's not getting there very fast by being in prison in Rome. He would have surely seen that the grass in Spain was greener, so to speak. It's not much green grass over there. Uh, compared to what was happening for him in Rome. But he doesn't. He says instead, I've learned in whatever situation to be content. Now if we're seeking to prove this claim that we can be content in every circumstance, uh, then we're already in fertile ground here in these few verses, the few words that Paul says here. Because the, the kind of the source of his contentment when he says this, in whatever situation I can be content, uh, is kind of disguised in our, in our English words, in the way it's worded. But it would have been pretty obvious, I think, in, in, in the Greek that Paul wrote in. Uh, because the phrase, I have learned, in whatever situation I have learned, is written in such a way in Greek that it has the meaning of a, of a one-off thing, or a one-off moment in which he learnt it. It's like the... Uh, aha moment. Who's had an aha moment? You know, when you work out how the microwave works, finally. <laughs> or you, you realise that someone's playing a practical joke on you that you didn't realise. Paul obviously had an aha moment. That's what he's saying. I learned it at some point. It wasn't a long process of learning for him. It wasn't that, that so, as it happened through these circumstances of, of want and hardship and struggles that he, that he goes through, that he that in the process he kind of learnt to be content in spite of it all. Rather, it was some point in time when it suddenly happened, when he learnt it. Um, so tell me, what, what was this moment for Paul? What was his aha moment? What's he talking about? It's obvious, you can say it. The road to Damascus, his conversion, right? Acts 12, Acts 9, we read how he met Jesus face to face. And it changed his life. It turned his life upside down. He was so discontent before this happened that he was killing Christians because uh, he thought we needed some change. You could paraphrase Paul's words then in this chapter in Philippians verse 11 as I found contentment when I found Christ. And he expands this idea as he continues. As he says, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, not only do we find contentment through finding Jesus, but we can face all circumstances with a strength that he provides. It's like Jesus matches every difficult and challenging or frustrating circumstance with an equal and opposite dose of his strength to deal with it. So that we don't slip into discontentment, but have the strength to continue in contentment. Remember that this verse here, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, is not saying that we can do anything we want through Christ who strengthens me. It's so often kind of ripped out of context, this verse. We can do anything uh, through Christ who strengthens me. Remember, it's, it's firmly embedded in what Paul's saying here in this passage uh, about the hardships and the joys and the want and the plenty as he's gone and served in his ministry, as he's served Christ, as he's done things for Jesus. It's, it's talking about following the will of God and what comes as a result. And it's through in those things that God strengthens us. In other words, doing God's will. And that's where contentment will come. If we're outside of God's will, if we're sinning and, 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 and doing things that are, are not in keeping with what God wants us to do as perfect ways, is he going to strengthen us in that? Is he going to give us the contentment that Paul talks about here? No. And so Paul, we need to keep this in context. So this idea that we can all be content in whatever circumstance obviously hinges on Jesus, on us knowing him, on us following him, on us turning to him and living in God's ways and will, being his people. And as a result, God's strength to do all things that God calls us to do and guides us through. Whatever circumstances they are, whatever struggles they bring, whatever life uh, brings, whatever heartache 
we come up against as God's people. Because like Paul, to find Jesus, to know him and his forgiveness and his love and strength is to find contentment. In 2014, uh, Ian Thatcher, who was the minister in Golden Bay, was diagnosed with uh, bone cancer, quite an aggressive form of bone cancer. And his uh, testimony, as I watched him through this journey and, and um, talked to him and heard what was happening for him, I really felt was a testimony of contentment in spite of what he was going through. A testimony of contentment and how God strengthened him through that. He remained, uh, he continued in um, ministry in Golden Bay for a number of years, right up until last year. So I think two years when he, after he was diagnosed. Uh, and he, he, was face, he was dealing with uh, extreme pain. Uh, he kept having to tell the, the, the people in the church not to give him a hug when they met him because his bones would break because they were so fragile. This is the kind of place he was in. But he spoke uh, about the strength that came in spite of what he was going through. And this strength that God gives comes in a whole range of ways. He said even in the mornings when he was feeling really you know, tired and down, a phone call from someone in church would pick him up just to continue on for another, uh, for another day or, or, or whatever. Um, God uses people to, to, provide, to strengthen people. Uh, he'd, open, he'd open the Bible and find there'd be a passage that he was up to that would be about God's presence with him. And so God would speak to him through his word and, and, and also miraculous things. He, was, he went into quite um, a rapid uh, decline of the, the count in his body. And so he was able to do some things and get to one of his son's wedding. And so God works in miraculous ways too to strengthen so we can continue on doing what we feel uh, God wants us to do. And what I found as I spoke to Ian uh, was this deep contentment because he saw how God strengthened him in this, in spite of what he was going through. And he spoke of that. We can face every circumstance through him who strengthens us. So let's get back to Paul again. He sort of applies this understanding as you go through this passage to a particular thing of um, understanding of contentment to this particular thing of a gift that's been given. Uh, this present circumstance he's in, he finds himself receiving this gift. And he says in verse 18, I've received full payment uh, and more from you. I'm well supplied. He doesn't say, this is not enough to cover my costs. I've got court cases. I've got all sorts of things happening. You should have given more. And he doesn't say, can you go and see the church down the road and get them to give a bit more as well? He doesn't. He says, I'm well supplied. I've received full payment. He's content with whatever comes. As he finishes, though, this, pa this passage at the end of this section, he again is keen to enlarge our field of vision to what being well supplied truly means in the greater context of the work of God. In verse 19, he writes, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. In other words, this, this gift is great. I'm well supplied. But this is nothing compared to the way in which God supplies all we truly need for contentment. True wealth is not in receiving gifts of money. True wealth is found in the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. A gift is nice, but knowing Jesus is better because it's in him that we find the full riches of the glory of God as he writes. Now it's here that we start, I think, really getting to the heart of what contentment is all about. When we are discontent, it means we want more of something. We want that Porsche we pass on the street. We want that grass on the other side of the fence. And so discontentment fuels the search for contentment, doesn't it? More of something to fix the problem that we perceive around us. But what if you found one day that you had all you possibly needed? Actually, actually, you were living uh, in the green grass, the greenest that ever was. And you looked around and, and thought, actually, I don't need anything else. Even the things that you thought you needed before, you don't anymore. When you get to that point, then there's 
No reason to be discontent, is there? Only content. Well, that's the point Paul says we arrive at when we find Jesus and trust him as our Lord and Saviour. He's ours, we're his. We become spiritual billionaires, if you like. There's nothing else in life or death that we need or could ever need because we now know Jesus. He is the wealth that satisfies truly. If we truly know him and seek to follow him, then there's no room for dissatisfaction. No reason for it, only contentment, because our gods will supply every need we have according to his glorious riches in Christ. And when we can trust him in this, we can be content in every circumstance. About two months ago, I met Nung. This is Nung. He uh, was in Nelson. He was um, uh, 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 shouted, if you like, to come over to, uh, paid for to come over to do the Caleb leadership course that we were part of uh, at the end of July. And uh, he's from Myanmar. He's a pastor in a, of a church in Yangon. And talking to him, I was just amazed at the different context in which he's um, are serving in. The hardships that he's up against, uh, he's facing, the, fa the whole the country is facing enormous economic struggles. They're feeling that even more in, the, in, in a poor and struggling church. There's political uh, change. Um, there's some state sanction restriction on Christianity. Uh, and there's a lot of struggles on the ground for him. I was talking to him and he confided in me that he got how much he got paid every month. $100 a month he's paid to be a pastor. $100 a month. Uh, when he started, first started a few years ago, he was paid $15 a month. That was his salary. Uh, a bag of rice was worth $5 at the time. Uh, he has to supplement his, uh, his supplement the finance with um, what he gets in by translating at, at nights to, just to provide for his family and to continue on and to be able to keep serving the church and also uh, being able to um, uh, meet the needs of the the really poor and struggling in his church. But when you talk to him, uh, you get this distinct impression that all this doesn't really matter for him. He, he wears this big smile on his face most of the time and he loves to laugh and talk in my admin so you, I didn't understand half of what he said uh, and tell you about faith and share his testimony and what's happening and, and tell you about Jesus and his love for the church. It just flows out of him. Uh, and when when I, as I got to know him over these two weeks, I was, I was struck by how kind of level he was in this. You know, he wears this big smile most of the time and, uh, and, and seems to be level. And what I found is that was simply an overflowing of this deep contentment that he has and that, that he's really a spiritual billionaire and it flows out in his generous character and how he is content in all things. You know, I've... Uh, happened to go onto his Facebook page uh, yesterday and he just put a post up yesterday that said this, contentment is something that comes with freedom. Contentment is something that comes with freedom and he's referring to the freedom that he has in Christ. He knows where that contentment comes from and he lives it out. I think Nung is a man who knows the true riches of knowing Jesus more than me. I think Nung finds that he is content in every circumstance. And I think he finds how much strength God gives him and how much he supplies out of the glorious riches of Christ. So this is what we set out to prove as we looked at this passage this morning, that we can be content in every circumstance. This is true because God's word says he will strengthen us in all things, that he will supply all that he knows we need according to the riches of Christ. When we truly get this, when we understand it and it sinks down from our heads to our hearts, we will realise there's no room for discontentment, but only contentment in every circumstance. And that's when we will realise what joy unshaken is all about. Let's pray. Lord, we have said that uh, finding contentment is not 
about flicking a switch when we're discontent. But we'll also discover that what it is about is knowing you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you that you uh, give us the wealth of revelation, the wealth of uh, all you are in Christ. Help us see that. Help us to constantly turn not to the things of this world to find contentment, but to the things that you give us, your grace, your love, your forgiveness, your spirit poured out. And Lord, as we do that, pray that we'd be surprised when difficulties come or when struggles come. We'd be surprised at just how content we are because you strengthen us in it. We pray that in want or plenty we would give you thanks. We would bless your holy name and we would point and focus on you, Christ, as the author and perfecter of our faith and the one who gives us true spiritual wealth. Amen.